another video purple political talk here and today we're going to be looking at the 2000 senate elections and doing a quick update on the map and honestly i think biggest there's been some big effects on the senate elections um because of just general endorsements and things that are going around and things are currently changing on a national perspective and we have to analyze those things to have an accurate and updated Senate prediction. So I'm going to start by filling in our safe Democratic seats for the United States Senate. And that's pretty much Oregon, Massachusetts, Rhode Island, um, New Jersey, Delaware, um, Virginia at this point, and the state of Illinois. So biggest thing, I guess, out of these states are probably Ma Ma Massachusetts. They're having a close Senate race in the sense of the primary the democratic primary is very contested in the sense that you have a very popular senator at markey going against a very famous and popular politician in the state of massachusetts joe kennedy the third so for that reason we might see a very close senate race and even on uh, the incumbent being unseated in the primary and that probably means that we're gonna have a very interesting primary race in the state of Massachusetts. And in Virginia, that's usually considered a swing or competitive state. Um, and at this point in time, there's no way that um, um, Mark, Mark Warner would lose that seat because he does not have an opponent. And usually in these uncontested races, it's very unlikely that you're going to lose to uncommitted or to a third party candidate. For that reason, Mark Warner probably will win by safe margin. And New Mexico, we can see about the same thing with Ben Ray Lujan um, winning by safe margin in that state. And just looking at it, Democrats are a little bit kind of way off when it comes to seats they already hold. But the chances of them picking up seats is very high. And that's really what's going to help them win the Senate race, probably. And this is another big thing that we're seeing. The Republican Party is defending a lot more seats and realistically they're defending seats in places they shouldn't even be worried about defending and at the end of the day it's going to be something interesting to see and watch kind of all develop and all these things happening so our safe margins are 39 republicans to 43 democrats so at this point in time i think these are going to be kind of the if Best case scenarios and worst case scenarios for each party is that um, either for the Republicans or worst case scenario is losing 39, having just 39 seats and for Democrats only having 43. And as we go on to fill in our Democratic safe states, um, likely states, my bad, um, we're going to see some flips. So out of the state of Colorado at this point in time, I would consider a likely margin as well as the state of New Hampshire and the state of Michigan and the state of Minnesota. These four states are, and the state of Arizona as well, these five states have very good candidates running in each of these races. You have three Democratic incumbents in Michigan, Minnesota, and New Hampshire, and they're very popular. Gary Peters is somewhat popular. He's going against John James, who's a Republican in the state of Michigan. He ran for Senate last time, actually, um, in 2018 against Debbie Stabenow and lost. So that just shows how popular, I guess, he is in the state. And he lost a Senate race there. So I think already that's, that, that state will probably go by five points for um, Gary Peters. New Hampshire, you have Gene Shaheen. It's going to be a little bit more contested because it's the state of New Hampshire. But at the end of the day, Gene Shaheen might win by eight points because she is so popular in that state. Same thing in the state of Minnesota. You have Tina Smith. Um, even with like all the political turmoil, I guess, that is currently um, causing instability in the state of Minnesota with all the protests starting there and all these different movements, um, Tina Smith might have a tough chance of re-election. But realistically, when you put it in the long-term view, Republicans are going to get blamed for um the police brutality and all that things. So Tina Smith will probably have an easy chance at winning re-election for her first full term. Colorado, it's John Hickenlooper, the governor. He's very popular, and he's going against a very unpopular re Republican opponent um with Cory Garner. He's a current senator from there. And at the end of the day, look, although Colorado could be a little bit more contested in suburbs and things like that, when you have a, someone that's super popular compared to someone who's absolutely not popular, you're going to start seeing differences. And Arizona, Mark Kelly, he is extremely popular in that state. And comparing it to a Republican incumbent who's unpopular and lost her election, 
in a very close Senate race in Arizona, you, he, she should be worried on Martha McSally. And at the end of the day, it's looking even worse for her. And in this case, I would say that Mark Arizona, Mark Kelly would win by five points or so by the time we get to election day. And this map is going to be a very interesting map to see because the amount of seats that um, Republicans have to hold on to win a majority is astounding. It's 11 seats out of these competitive seats, which means they're probably going to have to sweep the board in a lot of these places. So, as we go on to the Republican likely states, where are they getting their likely states? So, the South, I put it into likely columns just to show how close the margins were going to be. And at this point in time, I would also include Alaska. So, these four states, they're going to have close races for their state, quote-unquote, and they're going to be competitive. They're not going to be narrow, and they're not going to be won um, by one-point margins, two-point margins, but rather they're going to be narrower than usual. And I'm just going to go across the board and talk about them. So out of the state of Alaska, we have Al Gross um, against Dan Sullivan. And that race will probably come down to five to ten points, considering that Alaska politics is a bit weird, I guess, because they're a little bit flip-floppy with... Um, independence and governor with their independent governor and all these different things or they used to have an independent governor and with the state of alaska it's very hard to tell because there's usually not as much polling data from there but at the end of the day we're probably going to get closer to election day and have more data to analyze it but at this point in time i would give the victory to dan sullivan by around five to ten points mississippi is a different case we have cindy hyde smith and she it was she was elected um, narrowly and more narrow, narrowly than people might have thought. She was kind of unpopular for her race, but she still won by ten points, which considerable margin. And she's going. It's going to be an exact rematch of 2018, if I'm correct, with Mike Epsi. And it's going to be interesting to watch. But at the end of the day, it's probably going to end up going by five to ten points as well. Alabama, we have Tommy Tupperbill, probably. We still don't have um, official primary results, but it's looking like it will be Tommy Tupperbill going against incumbent Senator Doug Jones, and it's going to fall into the likely margin just because Doug Jones is a Democrat in um, Alabama. Look, although the South might have some Democrats that are somewhat prominent, um, examples, I guess, if you would call Kentucky the South with Andy Bashir or Georgia with Stacey Abrams, those areas are... Cause, because they're specific for the state. With Doug Jones, what ended up happening is that he narrowly won a race because the other person had had a lot of big scandals going against them. So at this point in time, Doug Jones is not looking very good for him because you have a very popular Auburn, um, was it Auburn or Alabama State University um, coach, football coach, and at the end of the day, that may be enough to get him over the top and beat Doug Jones. And out of state of South Carolina, Jamie Harrison and Lindsey Graham, we're going to be seeing something very interesting this year with that this race would be one of the closest in years. So recently, what are the biggest political activities we've seen in North Carolina when it comes to getting a little bit closer? Well, we can say that the first congressional district in 2018 flipped, and now you have Joe Cunningham going and being the representative from that district. And that is a very... um. It has a lot of cities in it. It's like all the coast. And that just shows how suburban, because they have like three major cities in that kind of district. So you're going to have um, many different um, suburbans, suburban votes like that. And you also have a very heavy African-American population in the mid, I would call it like the mid part of the state. And that there's like a belt right here, like probably like right there. And that really does help out the Democrats, especially when they're running Jamie Harrison. So, honestly, that's Lindsey Graham's seat. So, he's kind of unpopular. But, again, he, Lindsey Graham is one of those figures like Mitch McConnell. He's unliked, but he's been there for so long that he sort of is liked, I guess. And he's just there because he's just kind of one of the higher senators in the Republican Party. And those are all our Republican likely states. And now we're going to move on to our Democratic lean states. At this point in time, there's only a couple. And I think right now it's looking like it's going to be the state of Maine and the state of North Carolina. So with these states, it's very interesting to see because with the state of Maine, you have Suzanne Collins, the current incumbent Republican who is extremely unpopular. 
Her unpopularity is so high that she fell from being the most approved of senator um, by her constituents in 2016. And just it went over three years or, yeah, almost four years. She is now number 97 or number 99, um, just beating out Mitch McConnell um, by one point. And that really just comes to show that she's not popular. And someone like Sarah Gideon, who's a promising candidate for the Democratic Party, um, we could easily see her winning that seat and just um, put Democrats over the top, maybe. And this is going to be a close race. For the majority, it's going to come down to one or two seats. And I think this is going to be one of the key seats to win for the Democratic Party. And they could honestly do it with someone like Sarah Gideon being such a good candidate. And we can see almost the same exact thing in the of North Carolina. So, I don't know if you guys didn't know, but this seat is sort of cursed, quote-unquote. Um, the reason is that no no, no senator has been re-elected in this seat in a long time. In probably the last four or five election cycles. It's always a new representative. Um, so at this point, we might see that going, and obviously I'm not going to base it off of that, but realistically, when we are analyzing, it's looking pretty good for the Democratic Party. We have Kyle Cunningham, who has raised a lot of money for that race. He's out raised his opponent by, I think, two times, and honestly, that might really just be enough to push him over the top, as well as that he has a very good appeal for the North Carolina border, not only the African Americans of the state, but as well as the suburban, and then the more rural voters, which would be easy to be out someone like Tom Tillis, who is not super talked about in the state, but, you know. So, right now, these are going to be our Democratic lean states, so those two states, as we go on and move on to our Republican lean states. I would do, um, there's a couple. So we have the Texas Senate race, Kentucky Senate race, and we have Georgia's special election. So with the state of Texas, um, right now we're consider in the high lean margin, so around four to five points. And the reason for that is that John Cornyn is very unpopular. His opponent is nowhere in like a better or work per se. But still, Democrats are going to have a big push in that state. Especially since you have the Biden campaign who's going to focus on the state of Texas. And they're going to have very good chances of winning there. Um, or, or getting close. Not actually winning, but getting close. And Democrats are going to put a lot of money into this Senate race. Probably for no reason, because I think John Cornyn will be re-elected. But, who really knows? And, when it comes to the state of Kentucky, I would say that Mitch McConnell, like, probably Lindsey Graham... He's been there for so long that he, he could be so unpopular, but they still re-elect him. And it's going to be also very interesting since we are going to have a somewhat contested primary in the state. And it's probably going to end up going to Amy McGrath. But there's a new candidate that Bernie Sanders just endorsed for that Senate race, which could be interesting to see for the Democratic primary. And maybe that'll just be enough to split the seat and uh, all the vote and just give Mitch McConnell by a bigger margin. But Mitch McConnell is going to win that Senate race, whether Democrats like it or not. Maybe in a best-case scenario, they can unseat him. But that would be looking at extreme amounts of money spent, um, very good campaigning by the Democratic nominee, and just horrible campaigning from Mitch McConnell. And when it comes to Georgia's special election, I would say it would probably just be lean um, Republican, and actually, now that I'm looking at it, I, I will also add the uh, the regular Georgia Senate election. So, I'm just going to talk about special election first. So, in that race, we have Raphael Warnock. He is the favorite to win, and for the Democratic nomination, who he's probably known around the state, but he does not he does not have a nationwide political name, and it's mostly because that race has not been talked about as much compared to a race maybe like Arizona or a race like North Carolina, but he's probably going to go against either um, the incumbent senator, um, Kelly Loeffler, or Doug Collins, and that's going to be very interesting to see because it's going to be a contested primary, and at the end of this is going to be a jungle primary. If you guys are not aware of that, what that is, it's a type of election where a bunch of candidates, like an infinite amount of candidates can, ju- um, can run on election day and the two top top two vote getters uh, will move on to a runoff election if no candidate reaches more than 50 percent of the vote so it's probably going to be the democrats against either loffler or collins and 
it's going to be interesting to see what ends up happening. And when it comes to the regular Senate election, David Perdue is going against um, John Ossoff. John Ossoff is pretty well known around the state, and David Perdue is a pretty popular senator, I guess. Um, it's going to be an interesting race because of John Ossoff's popularity, but also we're going to be seeing a lot of different things and factors swinging this race into Democratic favor. And I think the biggest one is the African-American turnout. And honestly, Democrats are also going to focus a lot of time and money in the state of Georgia and probably not even to win the races there, but rather to keep on moving it farther left so it's easier for them to reach by the time we see a 2024 election or 2028 election. So that leaves all our um, lean states as we all go on and move to our um, tilt states. Let's just start with the Republican Party. At this point in time, Iowa is looking like it's going to go nearly to Joni Ernst. Joni Ernst is very um, unpopular in her state, which will be a deciding factor of her race. And if Democrats will run a good candidate, which I think they're doing, um, realistically, they're going to be able to win that race. And um, But realistically, they're going to have a lot of competition for the Republican side. And Republicans will have enough to win the race. And Joni Ernst, considering that she's unpopular, but she still has that Iowan appeal, it will be easier for her to win the race. However, looking at these other two states that are left, Democrats have a good chance of winning these two, Montana and Kansas. So when you're looking at this map, you're going to say, what is he saying? And don't be surprised. And when it comes to election day, I don't want you guys to be surprised and say, what, Kansas is going to the Democratic Party? Well, listen me out. He hear me out. So, Montana, just starting off, is one of the most competitive, if not the most competitive, Senate race in this cycle. We have a popular governor and a somewhat popular um, senator. So, Democrats have a good candidate running in Steve Bullock. Um, they've raised a good amount of money, and a lot of money is being spent in the state. Now, what is going to be deciding factors is pretty much going to be money spent and just popularity. If you haven't noticed, the GOP has been spending very big amounts of money into this race. If you go on YouTube at any time and search anything for political content, you're probably going to get either a Joe Biden ad, a Donald Trump ad, or a Steve Daines for Montana ad. Which is very surprising because I'm not in the state of Montana and I still get those ads. And just looking at it, it's going to end up going coming down to the nail. But Steve Bullock will nearly push it out because he's very popular. Consider this. He got elected on the same ballot that Donald Trump got elected. And if we're talking that he got elected on a midterm election, it would be completely different. But since he got elected on a presidential year where all the support was going to one candidate and one party and all, him as a Democrat winning is pretty astonishing. Which means when the other party is coming down in popularity, he has a very nice chance of winning that Senate race. And we can see something very similar to the state of Kansas, but it's not exactly the same. So this Senate seat, there is a retiring incumbent in Pat Roberts. And honestly, it's going to come down to the nail. We have Chris Kobach, extremely unpopular in the state of Kansas. I mean, he lost the, um, the governor's race in 2018 to Laura Kelly. And just looking at it, um, Barbara Bollier... She is running this race as a anti Chris Kobach person. And Bolia has a very good chance of winning this race, especially because of Chris Kobach's unpopularity. The GOP and the state of Kansas are trying at all costs avoiding a Chris Kobach primary win. Which right now it's not looking too good for them. But since Loric um since Barbara Bolier has a very good campaign going for her. She has an easy chance of beating him when it comes to election day. Um, an easy chance, I mean, is that the state of Kansas, it's a very contested scenario, I guess. So an easy chance means she has a bigger than normal chance of winning that Senate race as a Democrat. So at the end of the day, Democrats have a very good Senate map going for them. And maybe two or three years ago, you would have thought the 2020 Democratic map looks for the, the map for the Democrats look horrible. They have to flip some states that are not even considerable or considerably Democratic. But now that after the 2018 midterms and 
all the unpopularity and for Donald Trump and his growth in popularity in certain areas, that is really what is going to be affecting these races specifically. Voters in each different states have different set of values. While someone from the southeast, uh, from the southwest, might be voting for immigration issues, someone from the north might be voting for farming issues. Who knows? And that is really what matters. Democrats chose amazing candidates for these Senate races, while the Republican Party chose atrocious candidates, and that is a big reason why they're losing these seats. And I think it's pretty safe to say that I guess the Republicans did not focus as much in the Senate this time around compared to what they're focusing on for the House of Representatives. They're focusing a little bit, and they're getting better candidates for the House. But at the end of the day, this is going to be my prediction, and it's going to be 48 Republicans to 52 Democrats. So guys, I hope you enjoyed this video. If so, please give it a huge thumbs up. Like and subscribe, and turn on post notifications to get notified when I post my next video. Want to get classes for me of how to make an election night? Go and check out the Patreon link down below and sign up to become a Patreon and you get shoutouts, exclusive updates, and even a class to be um, how to make election nights. So guys, I hope you enjoyed this video and goodbye.